The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us for another discussion with my co-hosts, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. Elliot, let's start with you. Great. Thanks, John. I uh, wanted to talk about game theory in consolidating industries because I think it's a really interesting topic. And I've been involved in two of these situations over the last call it one and a half, two years. And it's an area where I wonder how it fits into investment strategy and understanding incentives and, um, you know, just high level game theories defined as the study of mathematical models of strategic interactions among rational decision makers. And so, you know, I I, I took that from Wikipedia, but I, I find this point rational decision makers to be quite interesting because you know, there's a presumption there that the people who are making these decisions will actually act rationally. And we have to divine whether um, some of these actions, they might have rationales that are rational, which are quite different than we'd expect in certain cases. So the first area I wanted to talk about is uh, in sports betting, where you have DraftKings who acquired and went public via SPAC. They acquired this company, SB Tech, to be their back end that took them off Canby's platform. Um, you have Scientific Games, who gaming, who over the prior five years had bought these uh, three strategic assets in the sports betting space and put them up for sale uh, to have sold them very recently to a um, UK-based uh, gaming company. And you have... Penn National, who first bought Barstool to give themselves like a media gateway into the sports betting industry, was working on Canby and then bought the score to go um, have their own tech stack. Meanwhile, you know, there's been this musical chairs of sorts where the big players have been acquiring these pieces and Canby's left uh, in this game of musical chairs without a logical partner. And, you know, you wonder about the game theory perspective within Canby and one of the things I grapple with is when you speak openly about your call to action being the outsourced business model, can someone even acquire you, leaving aside the poison pill issue, uh, when all your leaders insist that the outsourced business model is the only logical way to approach the industry? Um, and so, you know, that calls into question um, what would seemingly be rational or not, because the rational approach may very well have been to say, you know, hang the for sale sign and go and try to find um, someone to dance with, uh, the right partner. Uh, but then there you are. So the other industry, I'll, you know, trying to get this to some, some punchline, but food delivery is really interesting. Um, you know, by and large with the industry, you have these network effects, but they're really hyper-local. And these network effects are increasingly important as the industry has gone from marketplace to a logistics model. And you know there are some scale benefits, though the extent of which is debatable. Obviously, on technology, being able to acquire customers with brand marketing that's national in scope versus just using performance in local areas. Those are the two most clear-cut examples of the scale benefits. Uh, and then there are obviously like lessons that you can learn in geographies and the ability to A-B test across regions and kind of take these best practices and infuse them throughout the organization. So last year um, in the summer, you know, I thought we were on the brink of what I'd been calling Gruber, 
where Uber would buy Grubhub, then you end up with two large players in the U.S. being, you know, Grubhub, Uber, um, and DoorDash being being the other. And you'd have this situation where, you know, the acquisition would have been quite logical for Uber in terms of where their existing strengths were in market share, where their weaknesses were, and where DoorDash was strong. So it would have given Uber uh, basically like a significant chunk of the Northeast, um, some big markets in uh, the West, and DoorDash would have been strong um, in Texas and going outward to the areas where the suburban markets were really more important than, than the urban. Um, but then suddenly you had um, Takeaway swoop in and acquire Grubhub and give a beachhead for what had been a European player to attack the U.S. market. And at that time, um, Takeaway had just completed their acquisition of Just Eat in the U.K., the largest player in the U.K., um, in a heated auction versus Naspers, who had their own ambitions uh, of getting into the food delivery business directly in the developed world, despite having had several considerable successes as investors rather than operators uh, in the emerging markets. And then shortly thereafter, Uber buys Postmates after whiffing on Grubhub. Uh, Postmates had been running out of cash, and they were close to being in that no partner to dance with um, situation. And today, fast forward to today, you have an activist who originally orchestrated the Just Eat sale to Takeaway, is a large holder of uh, Takeaway still. And they're pushing for uh, what's now called Jet, Just Eat Takeaway, to divest of Grubhub. And so you've had all these pieces move. You've had all these players do different things. And, um, you know, and now they just want to break apart one of the one of the very recent moves. And, you know, one of the big questions to grapple with at the time of Just Eat coming in, uh, of Takeaway coming in to make the acquisition of Grubhub was like, is this an offensive or defensive move? And I think that's really under the purview of what's rational in that situation. Uh, perhaps doing something that was seemingly irrational to outside observers was rational insofar as, especially in the UK, where Takeaway had made a large acquisition, um, their most formidable competitor was, in fact, Uber. So if you go and create a beachhead on Uber's turf and start attacking them in that market, perhaps they could be less offensive. They being Uber could be less offensive in the UK market. And so, you know, offense becomes defense and vice versa. And so, you know, really, I think to pull this all together, um, the big question is often, what is rational? Um, who is the ultimate arbiter of what's rational? And how do you judge what's rational um, in real time without having like a very close lens into the decision-making and thought process of some of these people who uh, are somewhat coy publicly in how they speak about these ambitions because for fear of uh, giving away too much of what the next steps might be. Um, so I'm curious how you guys think about consolidating industries in general. Um, you know, we've talked about this uh, in the marathon capital cycle framework where consolidation and capital coming out of businesses, it creates really good opportunities for investment, uh, especially in the rationalization of an industry process where an industry is going from having immense amounts of capital invested to kind of consolidating and taking capital out. And how do you judge some of these things? Uh, how do you judge what is and is not rational? And ultimately, one of the things I'm grappling with is, are these situations to stay away from or are there really good opportunities to kind of prospect for what the next steps are using a game theory lens as an investor? So over to you guys. Interesting. I, I don't know if I've ever explicitly used a game theory style analysis in a industry context, but that's a that could be really useful, a really interesting way to do it. So I, starting with the question of who's actually rational and how to judge it, I mean, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have any good answer to it because it's so context specific. You know, it's kind of like the Justice Potter Stewart definition, you know, it when you see it. But I, I guess one thing you could fall back on is if people are doing things for reasons that just don't hold up at all if they owned the whole business. So if if companies are pursuing market share or outright size when they're obviously destroying capital and destroying value, right? I mean, the return on investment is so low or so obviously negative that there's just no way it could make sense 
then I think, you know, that that's one pretty good way to judge that it's not an entirely rational thing. And I, you know, but again, like where that gets so tricky is it probably started out making sense and they just take it too far. Right. I mean, I think one of the great ideas in all of finance and investing or business is that you get in trouble most often with the good idea that gets taken too far. And at least when it comes to Wall Street and investing, often it's pretty much every idea starts out as a good one in some narrow realm and then just gets taken way too far, right? I mean, securitization was a great idea. It just got taken way too far and led to the housing crisis, right? <laughs> and you could, you know, the same is true of lots and lots of things, right? I mean, derivatives were a useful idea, you know, for all sorts of, you know, practical applications. And then they got casinified and taken way too far. So uh, I think the same is true with supposedly irrational actors in in industries. I mean, I think a lot about, you know, the the land grabs that are so famous through history, you know, from prehistoric gold rushes on through modern gold rushes. And, you know, the oil and gas boom of 10 or 15 years ago, where the all the landmen like Aubrey McClendon would go out and just, you know, they, they could not have cared less about the numbers. And it was just about securing the acreage and securing the production, right? And I think if you had asked them, I mean, they, they would have found a way to justify it, but anybody could see that the numbers just made no sense. When when you're literally willing to pay any price, you know, that by definition can't be rational. So I guess that's one way to judge it. And of course, the other, you know, there, there's two fascinating examples on this that I always fall back on. One is uh, the cereal industry, which I think Charlie Munger originally pointed out because, you know, he said, look, it's it's a fascinating thing. And there's no real way to predict in advance who's going to be rational from an industry perspective. But if General Mills wanted to go try to take 20 points of market share from Kellogg's, they could probably do it. They'd ruin General Mills in the process. And they never have, right? I mean, it's been a very steady, competitive, but steady industry with very little market share won or lost over a long period of time. And yet you look at other industries, and of course, the great exam- great counterexample there was the airline industry up until about 10 years ago, where you just had you know, twice as many airlines as you needed, and they would overcompete to an extreme degree. I mean, one of the most bizarre things I find is that people still think that the airlines were raising prices in real terms, and that was just never true. I mean, the, the price of air travel today in real terms is down very significantly over the last 20 and 30 years. And so it's pretty hard to argue that they were, you know, over-concentrated or an oligopoly, you know, e- even now, I mean, the price of real travel is, is falling every single year that goes by. So it can't be true. But anyway, you know, I think that the point there is that the airline business for whatever reason, as opposed to the cereal business was less rational because the airline business was destroying mountains of capital in competing with each other for a reason that's hard to understand if it was just the early sex appeal of the airline air travel business that carried over versus the more boring CPG world. I don't know. It, it's uh, there's, there's not a good answer there. So I, I don't know how to answer who's actually rational or, or how to even judge. And I certainly don't know how to predict it other than to just say, you can kind of see it happening in real time. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I would think that most CEOs are rational. Um, I think the problem or, or one problem is um, comes back to agency issues where what's rational for a CEO, um, namely maximizing her own career or pay, may be irrational for the shareholders that want to maximize long-term equity value. So I think Agency issues definitely come into play um, in those uh, decisions. Um, and then another point, I think when we study um, game theory, let's say in, in economics in college, the payoffs are always pretty clear. I think in the prisoner's dilemma, the payoffs are pretty clear and you can kind of you know, have a rational view of what each uh, player should do. And uh, I think an example where the payoffs are also pretty clear is OPEC and oil prices because it's so well known, um, you know, what the demand for oil is on a daily basis and how much uh, a country can produce and so forth. And when they set those quotas, they pretty much know what they're getting at. 
Um, I think in some of these other industries like um, online sports betting, food delivery, the future is very much unclear. And I think when when the future is so unclear, it may be more tempting to kind of ditch the game theory analysis uh, as a CEO and just go hyper-competitive uh, for a while and just try to capture those markets and see where things shake out uh, in the end. There's definitely some game theory aspects. I think, Elliot, your point on um, you know takeaway um, with Grubhub kind of getting into Uber's uh, backyard, um, that's you know classic game theory. Um, so, yeah, I think I think those are a few thoughts. Uh, just to touch on airlines uh, quickly, I, I, I feel like when this hub and spoke model uh, was the only game in town, maybe it was easier to apply game theory. But once uh, there was a lot of point to point carriers, maybe that got blown up and uh, was no longer really relevant. Um, so just uh, a few thoughts from me. Yeah, that's an interesting point about the airlines. I hadn't thought about it necessarily in that way. But I think the the key point which you made, which I not really thought of, was just that, well, I think there's two big points. One is that the people involved and the incentives involved are such that you often get a tilt towards less rational behavior because the CEO or the decision maker in charge knows that it's probably not going to be more than a three to four year run. I mean, I think as the the last number I saw was that the average tenure of a Fortune 500 CEO right now is about four and a half years, just over four years. So, you know, it, it doesn't really matter if you do something that doesn't work five or 10 years from now, if you're not going to be around, if it starts to show progress in the first two or three years, you probably get a big new contract, a big new options grant. I mean, those are powerful incentives. And, you know, we can't sit here and judge you know, that necessarily, that's just human nature. And then secondarily, John, even better point, I think, is that in in true game theory, right, in the mathematical sense of it, or in a prisoner's dilemma sense of it, even, they, like you said, the outcomes are very clear. And in business, and certainly in investing, you have multiple dimensions to consider, and nothing's clear, right? I mean, you could do everything right and still get unlucky and lose, or you could be, you know, right for the wrong reasons, and it's really hard to go backwards and look at the counterfactual and say, oh, well, this is what happened, but here's what could have happened or should have happened. And so, yeah, it just gets really hard. And, and you know, to stretch your analogy with the airline business, it, it does start to turn down to like a circular firing squad at some point, though, because, you know, the airlines know, well, I just I don't have to outrun everybody. I just have to outrun the next worst guy. And so that just creates kind of a race to the bottom that becomes really, really hard to escape, you know, combined with the microeconomics of the business. So um, it, it's hard to accuse them of being totally irrational. So, you know, I don't want to sound too critical. I mean, running a company, making big decisions, allocating capital, these are hard topics. Um, and, and you combine big incentives, big money incentives and human psychology and ego and all that kind of stuff. And it's not hard to see how we get down into some of these crazy, supposedly irrational results. Yeah, you guys make a lot of really good points. And it, it got me thinking about like one of my favorite uh, book titles ever, Whose Justice, Which Rationality, which effectively argues there's no like true justice or rationality in some ways. And, you know, this idea that a lot of people take good ideas too far. Um, that's definitely one of the most powerful forces in markets. And that's where, you know, you tend to think it's rational to keep doing what had been working. But at a certain point, uh, you know, following just a playbook without having based more on inertia than like forward thinking uh, starts to get challenging. And John, that's just a great point on agency issues. And there's often incentive for um, professional management in contrast to founder led management to focus on growing the scope and the size of the firm, irrespective of bottom line shareholder value, because that just creates a bigger compensation pool. Um, so the more keenly focused some of these players are on creating wealth, the better the outcomes will be. What's interesting is in both these industries, by and large, a lot of the uh, acquisition targets have been founder-led, though in some cases, they've been founder-led with much less skin in the game than one would expect. Uh, in other cases, the acquirers have been founders themselves with um, basically their entire wealth on the line. OPEC's an interesting example too, because it's one 
you know, a lot of people talk about uh, price signal and how important that is. And I think it ties into some of this debate about whether we're seeing inflation today. A lot of people point to rising oil prices. And it's like, actually, oil is just not a rational market in most senses. The whole idea of OPEC is quite rational. But a lot of times you'll hear about some countries that, you know, the rational thing for them to do is to pump anyway, all else be damned, uh, and make sure that they could protect you know, the rational choice might be for Venezuela, who's starving of cash, to uh, get as much oil out there as possible um, and help themselves versus sticking with uh, quotas in order to optimize price for now and 10 years down the line. Um, so rational could have multiple dimensions to it. Yeah, and that's that exactly sense. right. That's exactly what happened, you know, in the airlines and lots of other industries or situations where, you know, if you just take it as a given for a second, we won't explore why, but that you get into that situation, right? Where Venezuela is desperate for cash and basically every airline in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is desperate for cash, right? I mean, that, that's that's the that's the only thing that matters, right? They're going to run their business. They're going to run the oil production just to bring in as much cash as they can to keep the lights on. And that's all you need to know, right? And then you can try to go backwards and figure out, you know, how did we get here? But once you're in that situation, it actually is totally rational to you know, if you have to light some capital on fire, but it brings cash in the door and keeps the lights on and extends the option and keeps your job going, that's a totally rational decision, right? Yeah, that's where I'm so fascinated with this question of what is rational, because you just, oh, there, there are a lot of situations where you just can't know inherently. Um, have, you guys, the, have you guys seen anywhere there's actually been, um, I, I've been trying to think of an example, and the only one I can come up with where a company willingly pulled the plug and liquidated was a company called Ambassadors Group, which was an overseas uh, online or not online in person student exchange, like foreign exchange company. And they ran a, a travel program every year. And it was a pretty good sized company. I mean, I, I want to say the market cap at its peak was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And Lisa Rapuano used to work with Bill Miller, was the, I think she was the chair of the board. And there were a bunch of other good investors on the board and they voluntarily liquidated, right? Because they were lighting capital on fire and they tried multiple things to turn it around and they switched CEOs, I think a couple of times and nothing was working. And the stock was actually trading below a liquidation value. And I, I actually participated, I bought some stock and made you know a decent short-term return out of it. This was years ago now, but I, you know, you just don't see that very often, right? I mean, that was rational because they decided, you know, hey, we don't need to keep doing this. It's not good for the shareholders. It presumably wasn't good a good use of their time either. Um, they could have kept going, but um, they, they pulled the plug. You just don't see that very often, right? Yeah, I remember that company because I traveled. Uh, I, I would buy my flights through them as a student. It was so damn cheap. And I always wondered how it would work. I didn't know about the uh, that they were a publicly traded company in that sense. But that's really interesting. Uh, and yeah, you know, you you really don't see that. And you think about um, there have been certain industries where you might think it, it would be beneficial to shrink the size of the business. But, you know, especially when there's professional management, you just can't get people in there who want to do that. I, I, I can't think of any examples of liquidations off the top of my head. John, any that come to your mind? Not really that are voluntary, maybe a few forced ones. But I, I think you know the maybe another point here is there's a milder version of you know liquidating a company it, and and the milder version of, applies to probably hundreds if not thousands of public companies and that is just to admit there's no reinvestment opportunities and to just be a cash cow and uh keep her, and return all the cash uh to the shareholders you know maybe you don't go to zero but um it's just very hard for a management team to say, oh, we see absolutely no growth opportunities and we're just going to run this as a cash cow and uh, either pay out dividends or buy back our stock. Just the fact that you never see that, I think, says speaks volumes about the agency issues because there are definitely many, many companies uh, where the shareholders would be better off if they just admitted that they don't have high ROI reinvestment opportunities. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think you're exactly right on the agency stuff. And 
So if we all agree on agency and psychology and incentives playing a determinant role almost here that you'd have to kind of proactively fight, it's it's to back to Elliot's original thing, like who is actually rational? I mean, it's it just, it's almost like there's no good answer, right? Because it's hard to criticize somebody for acting in their own self-interest if the incentives are really that strong. And so I, I don't know, it, it, this just kind of keeps going round and round, right? It's tough. Yeah, and I think if you if you really think about it, then it's logical that let's say founder or owner operated businesses have outperformed over time. And I, I I think I've seen studies that that show that, and it just makes sense because owner operated businesses don't have a lot of those agency issues, and what's rational for the CEO is rational for the shareholders. So um, that that would make sense. Great. Well, uh, Phil, over to you. Great. So kind of in a somewhat similar vein that we don't see many um, companies voluntarily liquidating or voluntarily becoming sort of a cash cow. It seems like they used to be more common. And another thing that used to be more common going way back in the day would be kind of a parallel investment function amongst com- inside of companies, either public or private for that matter. I mean, some of the you know, very famous examples are the old railroads, which had enormous security portfolios built up inside them. And Ben Graham was, you know, pursuing that as an investment opportunity as, a, as an activist or semi-activist almost a century ago. Sanborn Map was an early good example of that in Warren Buffett's career where, you know, a company was in, engaged in one business and had a, a securities portfolio that was you know, just as big Western insurance was another one he did, I think, uh, if I remember the name correctly, it was an insurance company with an enormous. And, and so insurance companies are a great example of that. But what I'm curious about is why more companies don't take advantage of this structural opportunity to invest, right? And this gets back to something we've sort of talked about where, I mean, obviously any companies, uh, you know, w- one of their main priorities as a fiduciary is to be a steward of capital and to be a a decision maker when it comes to capital. And and so whether or not Amazon has an internal investment function, I mean, Jeff Bezos has still been a capital allocator this whole time and obviously an exceptionally good one. But this this came to mind in, in a current sense with a couple of things that I saw recently, three things in particular. Uh, one, of course, was the news, I think it was just the end of last week that got a lot of attention, which was that Sequoia, the, the world famous venture capital fund, is starting uh, a new venture whereby they're, instead of just blowing out of the securities when they get shares in an IPO, let's say, um, they're actually going to create a new entity and a new vehicle that is able to actively manage those positions and keep them in perpetuity. And I mean, look, the guys at Sequoia are way smarter than I am. They're probably the most successful venture firm of all time. But why did it take to the year of our Lord 2021 to figure this out, right? I mean, it just seems like the most obvious thing <laughs> you could ever come up with, right? I mean, they have these unbelievable companies. And granted, I get it, a lot of their, their client base isn't taxable. But at a tax basis of close to zero, these companies are still going strong. Why would you just want to have to arbitrarily blow out of them or send them back to the LPs in kind? when there's just such an obviously easier, better way to do it. And so hats off to Sequoia for figuring that out and, and being one of the very few to take that step. Um, and likewise, I saw somebody and I, I tried to find it and I, I couldn't track it down, so I apologize, but somebody posted on Twitter that, uh, and, and this is apocryphal, so I don't even know if this is true necessarily, but on a plane ride once, and it didn't specify how long ago, that George Roberts from KKR kind of did back of the envelope math and realized that if they had just held on to the companies that they'd invested in over the years, they'd have a bigger market cap than Berkshire Hathaway. Same issue as Sequoia, right? Like you make some unbelievable home run of an LBO, like why do you have to just blow out of it, you know, three, five, seven years later, because that was the arbitrary structure that you set up, right? And so I think even the private equity giants like KKR are probably starting to reconsider that. And you've seen some of them take a step um, BlackRock has, has started their permanent capital vehicle. Um, another one that, that got my attention recently that I thought was just fascinating was there's a, a biotech company called Bridge Bio, and they just filed with the SEC to start an internal investment operation. And there, the, the CEO and some of the directors have some investment experience, and they've got somebody internally that's going to be running that. But I mean, they have a lot of specialized knowledge inside of a company like that. And if they have some investment 
jobs that they want to apply to. I mean, what an amazing opportunity they're going to have in front of them. So they're going to raise external capital and, and pair it with their internal capital and, and make investments primarily in public markets, but also potentially in private markets. And why not? I mean, that's just the most obvious thing in the world. So I'm fascinated as to why there used to be a decent amount of this, but still not enough. And then it seemed to go completely out of fashion for 75 years or something. And now maybe it's coming back a little bit to where, you know, instead of these arbitrary structural decisions, companies of all stripes, you know, public biotechs to venture capitalists to LBO firms are going to make a little bit more of an effort to say, you know, wait a minute, investment is a core competency of this company, or it should be, and we're going to make an explicit focus of the company. And so I, I tried to make a list of companies that that do this already. I mean, obviously, Berkshire, you know, Buffett figured this out, as with everything, you know, pretty much every good idea he's, he's already figured out decades ago. So that's the most famous example. And insurance, of course, does lend itself to this because they have the, the benefit of float and underwriting profit that they can invest on a pretty regular basis. So you've got Famous examples, White Mountains, Markel, Allegheny, Graham Holdings has done this to a pretty pretty significant extent. Um, Roper has actually done it, um, not necessarily with a, an internally managed fund of public companies, at least not that I'm aware of, but they, they've certainly managed the company that way. There've been a few reinsurers as well and some real estate companies, Arch Capital and Kennedy Wilson come to mind as like close-ish um, XOR over in Italy, uh, Bolare, some of those types of holding company structures. You know, as a quick aside, I mean, I do find the recent Facebook news is rebranding themselves uh, metaverse. I mean, yeah, obviously that's kind of a cheap PR stunt. And I, heaven knows I don't have any love for Facebook that, you know, this, this is going to gin up, but it, it is a smart move, right? I mean, look at what Alphabet did, Google Alphabet did years ago, right? And of course, they were explicitly looking at Berkshire Hathaway in that regard. So why don't more companies actually embrace that structure, right? So now if Facebook's not going to just be Facebook, it's going to be metaverse with Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and then whatever metaverse stuff comes next. I mean, that that makes a ton of sense. So I just, I guess, I'm curious as to what you guys think as to why more companies haven't taken a more explicit approach toward investment, whether that's something like what Bridge Bio is doing or what Berkshire and the insurance peers have always done or what Alphabet has done in, in this regard. And, and who am I missing? Like, who are good examples? I'm, I'm certainly missing dozens of them. So I'd be happy to compile a longer list and, and share it and send it around because I think it'll create a really interesting uh, watch list for people to, to keep an eye on over time. And then secondarily, I mean, why don't more investors go to companies and, and partner with them and propose this, right? So I'd be really curious if if you guys or if anyone else out there, please feel free to chime in on, on Twitter or somewhere and, and let us know if you know of a company that's doing this and not getting enough attention for it. Um, I'd love to hear about it or companies where, because actually Bridge Bio uh, made an attempt at this, I think five years ago when they first went public and just kind of decided it wasn't the right time to too many other focus. And now they've circled back to it. So I'd be really interested in knowing if there are other companies out there kind of somewhere along that path where they've kind of dipped the toe in the water and, and they just don't know how to proceed. So uh, with that, I will kick it over to you guys. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I'll, I'll break it into two parts. Like why don't companies do this? And then a couple examples of companies that do. You know, I think uh, it was about a week and a half ago, there were leaked rumors of PayPal and Pinterest, PayPal trying to acquire Pinterest. And I was like, oh, there's some interesting elements to that. And I put that out there over Twitter. And I immediately got hit with the, are you dumb? Don't you know that most M&A is value destructive? And the base rate of acquisitions is, is that it uh, destroys value at the firm level. And I think you know, I was reflecting, okay, so in the 70s, well, 60s, 70s, early on, you have this conglomeration era. And then 70s, 80s, you have this deconglomeration era. And a lot of people who came of age in business school in the 90s and 2000s were taught the playbook that M&A destroys value. Therefore, you know, by and large, don't do it, uh, especially when the goal is conglomeration. That conglomeration just results in empire building, and you might have this frenzy in stock price, and then boom, it's all going to collapse because it's a Ponzi scheme, and you can't make it work. And you know, there's some prominent short sellers who speak about uh, how bad conglomeration is as an idea. So I think you know, if if there were a big reason, that's one of them. I I feel like it was either 
Mark Andreessen or someone else prominent in Silicon Valley who lamented the fact that those uh, tech companies are not more acquisitive in nature. And so an example of a company who I think has done some interesting M&A, uh, like some strategy based, based on what you're saying is Salesforce CRM. Um, and one of the cool ways that you could get a lens into how they approach this is in 2016, their corporate development M&A deck was leaked. And you can see exactly which companies they viewed as targets. They have a slide of which companies they viewed as interlopers who they've thought could be acquisitive in their own sense and get in the way of their ambitions in the acquisition market. But you know, from the very beginning, Benioff's run this playbook of not being shy about acquiring to grow. And not just about acquiring to plug immediate holes, but acquiring to broaden the scope of his product. And he's done it in both horizontals and verticals. And I find that to be uh, quite interesting. Um, now with Berkshire, I think there's an interesting point to be made where, um, you know, I think it relates to my podcast last week where I talked about this idea that making fewer decisions uh, puts you in a better spot. And that's one of the values, I think, of some of this, uh, what you're talking about with Sequoia, like buy to not have to sell and not have to think about that. It's not just about getting good value. It's like when you don't make as many decisions, you're better off. And so Berkshire, with always having cash coming in, could spend far more time about thinking what to buy than thinking about what to sell. And then when they're thinking about what to buy, you could do it from the prism of my time frame is very long. I want to make very few decisions. And that inherently narrows your universe and forces you to not think about companies. Back to the podcast about getting to know fast. You don't have to think about companies that just don't fit, that don't make sense, that wouldn't be worth holding for a very long time. So that drastically shrinks what you're looking at. And I think that focus leads to better outcomes as well. Another company that comes to mind as a great uh, built on acquisition is Danaher and what the Rails brothers have done. Um, it's, you know, basically, uh, you can't even define what the company is and where they started because they've now created several different spun off uh, subsidiaries with their own like essence and, and, and focal points. Uh, but Danaher is definitely an interesting one. Um, and I throw IAC out there, you know, they know that acquisition is one of their core comp competencies. But what I find interesting about IAC related to the first half of our conversation today is that they do eventually pursue shrinking the firm in their own unique way. It's not about divesting per se, though they've used that in their playbook. It's by and large about, you know, they acquire, they nurture, incubate even, grow, and then give wings as an independent firm in spinoff fashion. So you'd expect the shareholder base to kind of stay along for the ride. Now, this B-Bio that you brought up, um, one, of, one of the things that caught my eye, you sent me one of the press releases. Um, I think it was interesting to see Andrew Lowe in there uh, as, as one of the advisors uh, kind of steering this push. And, you know, it's interesting to see a Viking PM too, because you think of a Andrew Lowe is far more um, associated with uh, quant investing. Viking is great in TMT, but generally I, I think of them as high turnover. So buy to own is definitely different. Uh, but I'd imagine the skill sets are, are, are really great and, and robust to build something out of it. But, you know, I, I think that's really fascinating. I'd love to follow more of these firms. Uh, you know, I remember in biotech in particular, while Martin Shkreli made enemies, his idea was that there is, you know, it, it was a different idea than Valiant, but his idea was there, there are unique opportunities, especially in early stage small biotechs to acquire and, you know, give, give wings. So um, those are some thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I, so to be clear, I don't know anything specific about Bridge Bio's plans other than what they filed in their regulatory filings in that article that, that summarized it, which anybody can look up, but you're right. I mean, they, they definitely have uh, investors uh, involved at every level of the company. And I, I have no idea what the plan is going to be, if they're going to be high turnover, low turnover, it just sort of referenced a, a full gamut of opportunity there. What I find so fascinating is that they're taking an extreme proactive approach to it, right? This is not some like, oh, you know, we, we'll, we'll do a little bit of this, a little bit. Of, like they're actually setting up an entity to invest internal and external capital, right? I mean, this is with an investment professional, right? I mean, this is not a dalliance. So, and I think that it's different. I mean, obviously Danaher and IAC are great companies and they've been, they, they run the company with an investor's mindset, but it's different than like what Daily Journal's done, right? Where Charlie Munger has taken all the excess cash and created 
at least as much value with his three or four purchase decisions over 20 years than the newspaper business has created the whole time, right? I mean, now the software business will see where that goes, but you get the point, right? I mean, it, it can work for almost any business, right? Any business that's producing a level of cash and particularly any business that's producing a level of cash at a good return on capital and particularly at the third and highest level, a business that meets those criteria and doesn't have immediate reinvestment opportunities, why wouldn't you try to do this? Why wouldn't you want to build out an investment function where you could deploy that cash on a, you know, whatever basis you see fit, right? I mean, I'm not trying to prescribe one size fits all. I mean, just the opposite. Every situation would by definition have to be unique to its own company and its own circumstances. But it's just fascinating that so few companies try to do it, right? I mean, even somebody as thoughtful and long-term and good as Mark Leonard has decided that, you know, he's going to make his acquisitions uh, you know, subject to his enormously successful criteria and industry expertise, but when excess cash builds up, he's gonna he's gonna issue special dividends, right? I mean, he's not retaining that capital like Daily Journal did, or obviously the insurance companies, the Berkshires of the world that we're all familiar with. So it's just fascinating because it seems like a pretty obvious and easy way to do a lot of good things at once, right? I mean, if you became a significant minority shareholder of other companies, you know, you get insights into those companies, not to mention the the hoped for benefits of long-term ownership. So uh, it's just, I don't know, it, it's fascinating to me that more companies don't do this. I guess I'll play a little bit devil's advocate or uh, or, or yeah. take take a more skeptical view of this uh, because I think it 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 goes a little bit in the direction of the failed Keiretsu model in Japan where there were mm. a ton of cross holdings uh, of, of companies and so forth. And it just became extremely unwieldy and, and inefficient and wasn't returns focused at all. And I think um, many investors, I, I, I guess myself included, I wouldn't really want my companies to, to, to do that. I want them to focus on their core competency and, and what they're good at and give me excess cash to invest how I see fits because I just don't you know there are some great examples of uh, companies that do a good job at this like a Fairfax like a Berkshire like a Markel uh, and so forth XOR Uh, but I would imagine that most companies out there would be either just average or or bad at it Um, so yeah I I guess and uh, well, from what I've seen about on on the Sequoia example, is that it sounds like they have a a huge position in Stripe, which which may go public soon, and uh, and you know they may may be a motivator behind what they're doing is the Stripe investment. I'm not sure, um, but I also feel like Sequoia might be doing this simply because it can it can get away with it. Uh, it's probably hard to get into the Sequoia venture funds, which have had terrific returns. Uh, but if, if I'm the Yale endowment, do I really want Sequoia to be charging me fees for a publicly held uh, Stripe position? Um, I'm not sure. I kind of want Sequoia to just focus on finding great companies early and and not be a hedge fund uh, in the public space because I got better uh, hedge fund managers at my disposal. Um, and, you know, I there's obviously the whole idea around the conglomerate discount and um, investors just not really rewarding companies for um, holding on to cash and and investing it how they see fit. Um, If it's something very related to the business, you know, like what Constellation Software is doing, that adds a ton of value because they have unique expertise in that specific vertical but to have constellation software just take cash and invest it elsewhere i i really wouldn't be sure if that would be such a good idea um you know maybe uh, an instructive example is if you think about xor versus fiat i mean xor kind of you know what you're getting it markets itself as an investment holding company uh but would I want fiat to be out there investing in a reinsurer and a gold miner and so forth? Probably not. I want fiat to, to just do the best it can running its its auto business. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I can see why companies would do it. I'm just not sure that I'd want them to to do it unless there's a really good uh, capital allocator at the helm. Well, you raised, th- so those are, there's like four good points there as usual, John. I'll try to go uh, through each one. So first of all, I think the, the best point there, or well, one of the, the good points, the base rate for, for success here is a, is a great question. You wouldn't want every company to do this. I think you're 100% correct there. And if you don't have someone within the organization who wants to champion this, and then someone who's truly capable as an investor to at least avoid mistakes doing it, then yeah, this is going to be a disaster um, and should be avoided. I think inertia and fear of being out of step or looking unconventional is the, the biggest reason it doesn't happen. I think you might get some people to talk about a conglomerate discount or feel like there's you know some financial reason not to do it. The, the Kuretsu example in Japan is a great example. I think that's a little different than what would happen in this context, because there it's like every giant company owns every other giant company and they're all producing subpar ROEs. And you know, I, I think that's just so extreme. I think it would be almost impossible to see something like that happen in the US or Europe where there's just so many, so many big companies that I don't know. I mean, Japan's its own universe in that regard. But it's a fair point. I mean, um, and like you said, I do think a lot of companies, if they're not careful, if we just passed a mandate that every company had to do this or something, you're right, the success rate wouldn't be very high. But again, you've seen enough companies that have different backgrounds, different industries, different skills and focus areas that, that have been able to do this. It seems like it could be taken from you know a fraction of 1% of all public companies or all companies, period, to maybe 10 times as many with, with quite a bit of success. Um, and then you know, as you mentioned um, there at the end, you know, I, I will say that I think I would rather have Constellation take all the cash that builds up and make a, occasional investments in publicly traded stocks that they know something about rather than send it all back to me as a dividend. I mean, I would sign up for that 10 times out of 10. So I, I would trust them to make that decision. I think they're they're very knowledgeable in the vertical software world. They're good investors. I would much rather have them. Over 10 and 20 years, it'd be a no-brainer. So I, I don't see a case against doing that with a, with a company like that, but I'm sure other people would feel somewhat differently. Yeah, just to quickly, I think it comes back in part to those agency issues we talked about. You know, if, it, if it's um, Mark Leonard, someone at the helm who you trust that the interests are aligned with the shareholders, uh, then you can be more sure that 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 CEO is doing it for the right reasons. Um, whereas if it's just a hired gun type of CEO that wants to do this, I would potentially look at it as empire building. Exactly right. That's that's one of the things I was thinking about too. I mean, you can look at two companies in general in the markets. It's never ceased to amaze me when you see two companies doing the exact same thing, but one gets rewarded for it and one gets punished for it because of what expectations they've uh, nurtured in their shareholder base. And it's like that Bezos quote, you get the shareholders you deserve. And so I think it's tough for certain kinds of companies to say, hey, we're going to go buy public stocks. I remember to pick on PayPal again when they um, you know, bought stakes in Uber and Mercado Libre um, to forge partnerships. And it's like a lot of people are, were thinking, what the hell are you guys doing? Why, why is this happening? Um, the Mercado Libre stakes done phenomenally well, not as much on the Uber, but I think I think it's interesting. There are some people doing this uh, in different ways, though. At the end of the day, like you know, no one really ascribes value to that in their PayPal model. You could look through like countless ones uh, from the sell side, and they just focus on what multiple of earnings is appropriate. So, in that sense, you could say it's not exactly value accretive to shareholders. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to touch on a couple of things because I, I think they're interesting. Sequoia, you know, one of the things I, I feel motivates them more than just, you know, the fees and other stuff is there's probably this envy of crossover funds who've been phenomenally successful, by and large, who've started in the public markets and have delved into the private space. Um, and a lot of these public funds talk about the access to information it provides as one of the key edges. And that being a private investor makes them a better public investor and being a public investor makes them a better private investor. And I think there's just this general blurring of lines. So it makes all the sense in the world to me for Sequoia to do it as well, because 
They have great information flow. They have great access. They have, um, you know, I, I don't think the skill sets are fundamentally different. So it's exactly in their wheelhouse. Um, but I also wanted to throw out two other companies that come to mind where it's gone kind of wrong. One is a small example. Uh, this company, Hunter Douglas, had so much cash, they started investing in hedge funds and it was effectively used as like the family's piggy bank. And, you know, I think that was a very weird thing. And they were listed in Europe. And I feel like that made it, um, you know, somewhat uninvestable, uninvestable to a lot of people. And then, uh, you know, I, I think a really big example would be like, GE financial products. Like, just think of all the ancillary things that GE did to be able to invest capital outside of their core industrial businesses and how that went and how much value was destroyed uh, along the way. So, um, you know, I, I, I could see both sides of the case. I, I do think it really gets back to what we spoke about in the first section on having the right incentives, um, having people who uh, have a long-term time frame and um, training shareholders to trust and believe in what you're doing. Because if that belief fades, uh, you could be forced to make an inopportune decision along the way for irrational, uneconomic reasons. Yeah, I forgot too, John, about your point on Sequoia. I, I mean, look, the, the fees are for sure a real issue. <laughs> and I, I don't think they've said, I think they said publicly that the fee structure would be different. I don't think they specified what it would be. So I don't think it's true venture capital fund fees. But look, I mean, whether it's the Yale endowment or anybody else, like the endowments have a horrible track record of managing their own investments, right? And so if they were to get a huge allocation of shares in Stripe, my guess is they would do worse with it than if they weren't able to get their hands on those shares in Stripe and they were managed by a Sequoia fund. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the same has been true of endowments that had giant early stakes in Intel 40 years ago or Berkshire Hathaway in the 90s. I mean, it, they just can't seem to get out of their own way. So again, you wouldn't want the fee structure to be too high and you obviously have an agency issue there, but I think Sequoia has got a pretty strong case on its merits to, to do something like this. Just like I think, again, with the caveat that it has to be the right person, it has to be a long tenure kind of situation. It has to be a company that genuinely wants to do this, but it just doesn't seem like it should be so hard for somebody to take a relatively prosaic business like a legal newspaper or a specialty insurance company and multiply the success over a couple of decades by being a halfway decent investor. Um, that, that seems eminently doable. So I really applaud the bridge bios of the world and others that are going to go out and tackle this because I think it's it's a smart thing to do. Great. Well, we'll end it on that note, Phil. Uh, great points. Thanks uh, to both of you for these uh, fascinating topics. Uh, another terrific discussion, and I hope our listeners enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much, guys. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.